Uh, we have one question I wanted to ask you guys, actually, because, I mean, both being students yeah. of history. And, sure. Um, the, the different groups that existed in Afghanistan, I, I interacted with some of them, especially around Kabul yeah. and the region, but others, of this, like the Turkomans, the, the, I interacted with a little bit of Uzbeks, especially in prison, but before that, I really didn't know much about the society, the Hazaras and, 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 and the other groups that exist. Has there been, to your knowledge, is there a, is there a, uh, is there a melding of views? Or do they coming together, or are people still very much in their own um, ethnic bubbles, or uh, in terms of Afghanistan and its future? Sangar, I'm going to let you answer this one. <laughs> the the thing is, is that uh, as you know, Afghanistan, uh, the landscape is the way that uh, it separates people. Uh, you know, valleys and mountains they separate people in different regions. So uh, obviously, historically, people have lived in their own bubbles in a way. Okay. Uh, however. Um, Due to war and instability in the last uh, 40 years, a lot of people have moved into the cities. So in a city like Kabul, you have people from all backgrounds, all ethnicities, so, or all regions. The same applies to a city like Herat or uh, Mazar Sharif. Uh, so the cities attract people from all regions, and people become sort of uh, uh, they, they enter in a melting pot. However, what happened is that um, these warlords they they need uh, and and uh, these warlords and these entities they need to have some sort of backing from a particular group. So they have tried to uh, play this ethnic card and play people against each other. So if you're a Pashtun warlord, you emphasize the fact that you're a Pashtun and that uh, your tribe has to support you because you represent them. And then you have a Uzbek warlord doing the exact same thing, the Hazaras doing the same. And then you have these democratic, uh, uh, you know, uh, clean-shaven, westernized Afghan who are secular and enlightened and they're doing the exact same the same thing they're constantly instigating conflict between different groups of Afghans they're putting uh, they're, they're, they're uh, forcing people to consider each other constantly as competitors uh, for, for for resources for for rights and everything so uh, I think that uh, uh, while the urbanization of Afghan society is an opportunity to bring people together, to, to create a general sense of unity between people, uh, these forces, these warlords and these entities who are all uh, either backed by Iran or United States or Pakistan or Russia, they use these ethnic lines and divisions to, to, to uh, reach uh, what they, whatever they want, to become more powerful, but as a result, the, so the society remains very fractured and weak. So yeah. that's, that's the result of what they have done uh, in, in these years. And, and uh, uh, I think that for the peace talks with the Taliban, it is necessary to have a representation of all different aspects of our society. Yeah, but, uh, but what I am uh, uh, really skeptical about is who is going to represent all these groups because the people who claim to be their representatives, they have a vested interest in conflict because they uh, uh, rely on, yeah. on division and uh, hostility between groups in order to become uh, the people who they are. So, yes, it, it, and, it, it's, not, it's not a pretty it picture. <laughs> it must be mentioned, sorry, saying, it must be mentioned as well that the uh, Afghan government, in its like, uh, short lists for negotiating teams, uh, has often uh, included individuals who are the sons of warlords, which the current Afghan government is actually at odds with. So if Kabul is at odds with Atama Madnur or Dostum or this or that warlord, it still includes the, the sons of those warlords in the negotiating list. And the sons of these warlords, whilst their fathers, okay, they may have abysmal human rights records or, you know, we could cast doubts on their moral integrity, uh, they are to a very large extent attuned, well attuned to 
social dynamics in Afghanistan or wherever they're from. Their sons, however, have probably spent more time in Dubai, Palm Island, or in Turkey or somewhere else. So we cannot even say that their their sons are, you know, well acquainted with the intricacies of Afghan society the way that their fathers are. So, you know, the, the cycle is being perpetuated of the personalization of power around you know, ever shift, ever shifting um, dynamics, whether it be religion or sect or ethnicity, and one of the mentioned, one of the points you mentioned, Mazam, earlier about uh, your bubble being burst about the Mujahideen, right? Um, one of uh, what we saw in the 90s is that whilst there are caveats here, and it was it's uh, in, inaccurate to characterize the civil war as entirely being based on ethnic lines, uh, ethnicity did play a role. And you had uh, Mujahideen groups, Mujahideen leaders allying with the different factions of the Communist Party, right? So you had, for example, Ahmad Shah Massoud uh, allying more with Parchamis. And Parchamis, generally speaking, uh, were of more Persian-speaking, Dari-speaking background, whereas Hikmatyar was more allied with Khalqis, and uh, Khalqis were generally more Pashtuns. So really, this uh, this trend um, really uh, inflicted a devastating toll on Afghanistan, not just materially, but psychologically, uh, and you know, on the moral fabric of the country. And the scars that that civil war caused in the 90s uh, have not healed. Simply put, they have mm. not healed. Um, 2001 was just a continuation of the civil war. You could, you know, there's a very good case you could argue for that. And so what we're seeing now, is, it, you know, it's no surprise that we're seeing this. I mean, look, uh, one of the things that happened when I was in Afghanistan, it was two days before 9-11. Again, I was in Kabul at the time. Um, and I think uh, Al-Qaeda carried out uh, a, a... Attack on Ahmad Shah Massoud. Yeah, Massoud and killed him. Now, I grew up, um, you know, actually having a great deal of love for Ahmad Shah Massoud because of his whole stature being the Lion of Panjshir, how he fought the Soviets, and the praise and the simplicity of the man. I also met, even though that I know that you know the Taliban fought against him, I met a prisoner, a Taliban, who had been a former Taliban prisoner, who was held by Ahmed Shah Massoud, and he was then released. And I said, I asked him, what is the man like? I asked him, what is, what is he as an individual? He said he's one of the most pious individuals that I've ever come across. Um, and he said that I remember that when we'd eat, he'd eat, he'd eat from what we ate. And I remember also that, you know, I'd get up to pray and he'd get up, he'd be awake in the middle of the night, uh, praying, reading Quran, his recitation was beautiful of the Quran. So he would, from all intents and purposes, he seemed to be a genuinely uh, yeah. loved, loved man amongst his people. Yeah. And whatever he may have done in terms of taking friendship with the United States and uh, and allying with them and whatever, and the, I think one of the reasons why the, the hatred that I saw that happened from a lot of the Northern Alliance on the Taliban was because they killed Ahmed, they accused him of being responsible for the death of Ahmad Shah Massoud, and that sort of fed into the, um, the fact that they killed our beloved leader. Uh, what do you guys think about that? I think I think there's a I think when we when we come especially with regard to uh, politicians who articulate themselves on an Islamic basis, um, oftentimes you'll hear their critics saying, "Oh, he's not even religious." Um, you know, he's this, or he doesn't pray, or he drank wine here, or whatever. Um, the actual piety of people, um, you know, is not really something that anyone can verify. Um, you know, it's uh, it's very it's very because they say. I think Sangar mentioned this in our last podcast as well. They say Dr. Najib, who was the last uh, communist president of Afghanistan, in his four years in the UN compound in exile. Uh, he would pray every night uh, to Hajjad prayers and whatever. So there is a massive caveat of these individuals and their personal lives and their personal relationships and how you, you know their their own experiences with religion. Uh, what we what we can say though, what we do, as political analysts, what we can and what we do judge are the material or the moral consequences of the policies or the decisions that these politicians have taken yes. and unfortunately and in Afghanistan yeah and, 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 just to say that 
is that this was a testimony given to me by somebody who was yeah. an enemy. Yeah. 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 And that, just to say that he was he was genuinely loved by his people, and it's because of that the fact that he was killed uh, under the leadership of the Taliban that that hatred exacerbated. Um, but that that's not and that's not that's uh, also the fact that the Taliban committed their own fair share I mean because the society's social fabric has decayed like Sangar said uh, and because politicians have been so destructive and amoral um, you know I, I th even the Taliban as a group which rise in a you know which uh, rise in response to these warlords and these mujahideen and these abuses they didn't actually manage to escape uh, doing the same things that their sworn enemies did the taliban carried out their own uh, unfortunately they carried out their own massacres on the basis of ethnicity they committed their own human rights abuses uh, they implemented scorched earth tactics in um, shamali so, you, in Shamal, yeah, exactly. Yeah. My paternal family are from Shamali, so th there is this caveat that these politicians, you know, we could. The, unfortunately, the result has been the the general way in which politics and war, by extension, has been conducted, has been very destructive. And and the thing is about uh, uh, people in Afghanistan, especially the old older generation, the people uh, f from, uh, let's say before my generation uh, they have a much more nuanced perception about these political figures these leaders they have seen them they have sat with them they they uh, they have a much more holistic perception of who Ahmad Shah Massoud was who all these other figures are uh, there is a video uh, uh, I don't know if you have seen it uh, Walid but there is a video where uh, the leader of Hezbollah Ahdat the uh, uh, Hazara Shiite leader is Mazari. Uh, yeah Mazari. He's complaining to Jalaluddin Haqqani uh, about the uh, civil war in Kabul, and uh, Jalaluddin Haqqani with uh, several other leaders are sitting in front of him, and he they're listening to his complaint. He's saying uh, all these uh, leaders, the Mujahideen, they are involved in a civil war in the city, and they're killing each other, and this is not how we reach unity. So this this particular historic event reveals how the relationship was of people at that particular time. Okay, yeah. uh, their actions, their policies and their infighting have resulted in most horrific things that, are we, uh, that we are seeing today. However, we have to bear in mind that, that uh, at that particular time, people had a different experience with each other. And as Muazzam describes, you know, uh, uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud is praised by many people. And, and he is considered as a very revered and respected leader. And uh, rightly so, because the people in Shamali, the people in Panjshir, they see him as a leader. Uh, and and uh, they have reasons to praise him. They have reasons to love him. So, so while we have this... Uh, uh, understanding of of uh, of their experience, uh, the people who uh, obviously uh, saw him as their leader. We have to also acknowledge that all these different groups in Afghanistan they have their own uh, revered leaders, and exactly. and as a community, as a society, we need to go beyond these uh, hostilities and 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 actually empathize with each other. Uh, uh, yeah. to understand like okay he was your revered leader uh, such and so is our revered leader but but let's not glorify their crimes I, I, what I'm advocating for is like for instance there are so many people I am related to I, I can I can defend them I, I can I can say yeah. well he was so wonderful and he was so great but what I would be doing is actually downplaying the crimes that those people have committed I would be denying the fact that they have re caused oppression against other people. So uh, that's a very, so, that's a very good point. Yeah. 